Welcome everyone to this session of the Linguistics Career Launch. My name is Alex Johnston and I will be hosting and introducing our presenter today. And our session today is called Human Computer Interaction Jobs and Industry Overview. And our presenter today is Kelsey Krauss, and I will let her give a fuller introduction to herself as she begins her presentation today. Thank you so much for being here, Kelsey. Thanks, Alex. Let me pull up my, um, I have a little slide deck I wanna share with you all uh, while we go through this. Um, thumbs up if you can see my screen maybe. Great, okay. Um, thanks so much for uh, attending this. Um, I'm gonna talk today a little bit about human language technology and in industry, just kind of a brief jobs overview. Um, I want to kind of say upfront that while I do work at Cisco, I am not representing Cisco in any official capacity today. I'm just here as a linguist and tech and I want to um, share my experience that I've had um, going through this process with you all. So um, let's get, get going. So I'm going to do a brief intro of myself uh, first, and then we're going to jump into um, two kind of distinct sections. So first, what careers are like for linguists and tech, and then kind of what the process is to apply for these jobs. And I do realize that this is kind of these are kind of disjoint things. Um, so if you do have questions while we're going, put them in the chat. If I see them, I'll hopefully try to respond to them while we're going, but we can also take those at the end too. Um, so with that said, let's get going. Um, first of all, I wanna just introduce myself. So um, I was a transfer student to UC Santa Cruz. I did my, my bachelor's in linguistics and in German studies. Um, once I graduated, I also was a Fulbright English teaching assistant in, in Germany, um, in Berlin, where I taught English uh, in a high school there. Um, and I finished my PhD in linguistics on kind of the pragmatic interpretation of discourse particles and prosody um, in, at UC Santa Cruz in 2018. So that means I've, I've been about three and a half years in the industry and I've also had a couple of pretty distinct jobs. So um, first of all, I was a, a consultant. I was a contractor at a deco, but I was working at Google. Um, there I was working as a linguistic project manager on the speech team. So basically we were creating new text-to-speech voices for the Google Assistant. So uh, in particular, I created or helped create um, the the Hindi English code switching Google Assistant voice, as well as a couple of voices in French and in German. Um, after uh, that, so that was a contract position, and so after that, I moved on to a full time position um, at Amazon, where I was a language engineer. And so, I'm not sure how much. Uh, introduction we've had to um, like language technology stuff before, but language engineers, it's kind of the opposite side of the speech um, track. So whereas at Google, I was working on um, the production of the voice from the assistant. On this side, I was working on the interpretation of that voice. So um, so there I was you know, helping to design and build uh, test grammars to train new features for Alexa, specifically for Alexa Auto. So they were building a competitor to Google Maps. So um, if you have an Alexa and you say something like, you know, Alexa, what's the shortest distance between Santa Cruz and San Jose? That's a feature that I, um, that I helped implement for better or for worse. So if there are any bucks, I'm not working there anymore. Please don't, please don't send them to me. Um, and so currently I am working um, at Cisco. So I am part a uh, voice user interface designer and I also do some data science and um, data analysis. So I've now kind of worked in all realms as uh, the voice user interface part is, you know, once you have the assistant which can um, understand you and talk back to you, 
you also have to be able to um, create dialogues and conversations that are going to be natural. Um, so, you know, whenever you have a conversation with Siri or Alexa or Google, um, there's there's an actual flow behind it that that, you know, you enter into some sort of dialogue state and, you know, we're trying to make natural dialogues there. So there you kind of work a bit more with designers and researchers to to refine these voice interactions. And then on the more data science and analysis part of things, um, we're also looking at the, the natural language understanding quality. So we do look at feedback from users. We look and see, you know, um, in log data that we have, maybe a user had an interaction where it ended every single time with them saying no or cancel to the assistant. So then you can go, go back and look and see, you know, oh, maybe something was happening there that was against the user's expectations. Um, and, you know, you can go back and kind of go through and figure out how you can change those things. So that's a little bit of an intro to me. Um, we're gonna now move into careers for linguists and tech. And I see here in the chat that um, they're going to have a panel on consulting and contracting a little bit. So this is good. This will be a little bit of an intro to, um, to what's, what's to come in there. Um, so I have this big disclaimer here because there is a difference between uh, full-time employee jobs and tech vendor, um, vendor contractor positions as well. Um, some of the biggest differences between these things are uh, full-time employees are, you know, the direct and permanent employee, employees of a company. Um, you're usually, you know, you have access to employer-sponsored ben benefits, so healthcare, equity, bon bonuses, promotions, things like that. You're usually salaried with paid time off, and there is relative job security. Um, on the other hand, there is this divide between temps and vendors and contractors where a lot of the times you are working for an intermediary company or a staffing agency, but you're actually working with those direct full-time employees at the company. Um, you're not usually performing the exact same tasks though. Um, these are usually fixed contracts, three to six months. Um, for contractors, those can be extended up to two years. There's some differences between vendors. Vendors can actually be, um, their 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 time frame for working is a little bit longer and this is hourly generally no pto but the contractor temp vendor um, category does offer a bit more flexibility in terms of um, working a lot of the times from where you can work and things like that although of course everything is shifting and changing in the in the last year um okay so uh i have kind of built this explanation or overview of these types of industry jobs into two continua. So these are these are my um, my organization of these things. So you know don't go looking on Google or whatever to try to find these. These are mine. You can have my slides later, but um, this is something that I have done to kind of help myself, you know, think about what what is it that I'm actually looking for in a job. So um, this first continuum is technically oriented jobs. And what I mean by that is um, what your employer needs or thinks they need in terms of specific quantitative or computational skills. And it's just a pretty basic, you know, I've done it from less technical to fairly technical. And we'll go through each of these here. So these less technical positions are things that, you know, they're all things that, that we have as linguists, right? We, we have critical thinking skills. There's an emphasis on maybe technical writing or qualitative research. Um, and these tend to be jobs that are um, a lot more maybe user focused or customer focused, or um, there's a specific end person that you're going to be working for and maybe working with. So um, curriculum designers. This is for this this company in particular does curriculum for uh, K through 12 schools. Um, there are things like a linguistic project manager at ADECO. So that's what I was doing when I was working um, at Google. So there was it was a bit less technical in the sense that I didn't need any scripting skills, and there was a lot of interacting between um, people 
and also projects. So these are going to be more people and project based jobs a lot of the times. Um, moving on to this moderately technical kind of in the middle uh, portion. Those are things where you're going to have a little bit more of that linguistic data analysis um, skill where that's going to be more emphasized. You might need to know a little bit of, um, of coding and definitely pattern recognition, which is something that we all have in common, something that we're all pretty good at. That's going to be something too that's really that really puts you in a good position for these moderately technical jobs. Um, some, some job titles you might look for if you think that a moderately technical position is something that suits you well is something like an analytical linguist at Google, language engineer at Amazon, um, or an associate or junior linguist at uh, ADECO or Memo Technologies. Um, and then going on to the fairly technical um, uh, aspect here, uh, these focus a lot more on um, skills that maybe we might think are a bit more computer science-y or computational linguistics um, adjacent or actually computational linguistics. So things like machine learning, natural language processing, you might need to do a lot of writing and reviewing code. And there's like a lot of quantitative research that's really expected of that. Um, I want to point out too, that when you're searching for things, you really do need to look at, you know, who, who the job is or like, it's not just about the job title. It's about what's in the job description as well, because as you'll notice, Google, for example, their interpretation of what an analytical linguist does is much different from what an analytical linguist does at Spotify. And the same for the, the job title language engineer at Amazon versus at ADECO. Um, all of these things are, you know, out there and available, but unfortunately there's not a, a clear definition of what any of these things mean. Um, I also wanted to point out too that these, these jobs that I have put in blue, these are all contractor positions. So there's also not a clear distinction between whether or not a job is a contractor position and whether it's a full-time employee position based on the title alone. So what that means for us is that we really do have to focus on um, job descriptions and what, the, what, what it actually says in the details. But we'll get there in a second. Um, and just check the chat. Ah, so Aubrey, you ask, are most of these positions generally for PhD holders or have you seen people with master's degrees as well in these positions? It really just depends on the company and what they're looking for. I've seen a lot of master's degrees positions. Uh, actually, probably most often people get, get, get jobs with master's degrees, um, especially at um, Amazon and um, maybe like Spotify. If the fairly technical jobs actually tend to um, hire a lot of master's students, um, especially if you've um, specialized in computational linguistics or some sort of natural language processing machine learning. Um, ah, yes, and then there will be a session about that. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Um, so let's move on to the second continuum. Um, so here, this is more language oriented jobs. So here, um, maybe you'll want some more linguistic or language expertise, or the employer will want a bit more linguistic or language expertise um, for these particular um, positions so that here the continuum is from not language focused to very language focused and you'll notice too that there is some overlap on these two continua it's not that these are completely separate um, these are just ways different ways of of slicing up the pie um, so for these not language focused jobs um, these tend to track a bit more with those uh, fairly technical jobs so there are things like doing data analysis, Python scripting, uh, model failure. A lot of the times they'll have titles like research scientist. Um, usually these jobs, well, not usually, there, there are a lot of these jobs that, um, that have a position of kind of being like a researcher, like just a regular researcher, but at a big company. Um, those can be pretty pretty good positions for, for people with our skill set. Um, so some of the more moderately language focused positions um, are actually the ones 
that usually have linguist or language or something in the title that we would recognize as being something that really fits our skill set. So here, you know, you might need some subfield expertise or syntax semantics phonology, maybe some project management, maybe some language data analysis. So for example, um, moderately language focused could could be something like, you know, you're analyzing failures for um, why the text-to-speech voice that you've just synthesized isn't um, isn't sounding natural. And what you know, what you're doing is you're doing linguistic pattern recognition. You are, um, and and maybe you notice that uh, retroflex consonants aren't um, being uh, produced with aspiration or not. If we're if we're doing the you know Hindi English uh, code switching voice, and that's something that you know maybe if you didn't have that linguistics background, you wouldn't be able to hone in on that small. Um, piece of data, but with that language expertise or with that subfield expertise, being able to look at the phonologies and pull out these things, you are able to kind of, um, you know, understand what the problem is and, and where to go from there. Um, and then the last, the last uh, circle here is the very language focused things, which again, kind of track with the um, with the the less technical jobs but not it's not a complete overlap so here there's a lot of um you know the technical and creative writing stuff is is emphasized but then there's also like actual language analytic expertise so maybe you're a speaker of bengali and you need um a particular company is looking for people who speak bengali so that they can go in and annotate um utterances uh that's where you know that language expertise would be um would be helpful cool so with that let's uh let's move on to kind of like the question that we've been kind of encountering the for the past couple of minutes which is like how do you actually look for these jobs um the most obvious thing of course is to go to the actual company that you are interested in and do these keyword searches on those company websites. So keyword search, you know, you think, okay, linguist language, but there are all of these less obvious but still relevant things that linguists are are working in. You know, maybe maybe speech data analyst is something that this company thinks linguists do, and that's the term that they've decided on. Um, at Apple, for example, there are a lot of linguists that are called ontologists or taxonomists in turn, instead of, you know, analytical linguist or or computational linguist. So there's there's a lot of there is a lot of searching that you have to do. Um, but once you kind of know what to search, these are things that, you know, it, they'll, they'll come, the jobs will come. Um, and you know, don't worry about writing all of these down. I will I will send these slides to whoever wants them. Maybe I can send them to Emily and she can make them available. Um, so don't worry about that at, at the moment. Um, another thing is to look for smaller companies or nonprofits, um, startups, and then also, you know, create a LinkedIn profile and set your job search preferences and create job alerts. And it's really, you know, as much as I kind of didn't want to create a LinkedIn account when I was first looking uh, for jobs, it really, really helps, especially the more specific you get in terms of um, your the in terms of your skills, your skill sets that you have, and the things that you say that you you are an expert in that you're interested in. That really helps kind of tailor those job alerts to to you and to your skill set. Um, and then again, I won't go through these uh, in any depth because there are a lot of representatives from these linguist career websites at this um, at this whole month long event. Um, but these linguist career websites have really great uh, resources for that as well. Um, I'm going to pause and look at the chat for a second because I think there was something here. Ah, okay, great, good. Okay, so um, 
now I want to move on to a little bit in the last couple minutes that I have before we open it up to questions about what the job application process really looks like. Because, you know, for me, this was the, the scariest part, the part with the most unknowns, right? Um, so the one thing that I want to say is that there's no perfect formula for landing a job whatsoever. Um, but what you want to do is focus on the things that are actually in your control. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next couple minutes is like job prep is about increasing your chances of being hired. And that is about focusing on the things that you can show to others. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks, Karina. <laughs> um, that you can show to others that you, you, you've you done. Um, so, you know, getting your first job does take some work and also a bit of luck, but it will happen. Um, so first of all, here is this hiring process overview. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to submit your resume. Maybe they require a cover letter. And this is really the part of the process that you control. You own this part of the process. Um, I'm not gonna go super in depth because I know there's a bunch of other seminars on resumes and all of these things, but this is the process that you're, that the part that you control. Then, you know, there's also the hiring manager, which is the person that's gonna receive your resume at some point. They usually make the final, the final decision about your hire. Um, with the help of the rest of the team who you might interview with. They're going to be the most knowledgeable about the role day to day. But in between the hiring manager and the rest of the team are the recruiters. And this is the wild card here because unfortunately they are usually the least knowledgeable about the role, but they are also the gatekeeper to the role. So it's the recruiter that you need to basically tailor well, you need to tailor your, tailor your resume for the hiring manager and the rest of the team, but in a way that the recruiter can understand um, and that they can uh, then know to pass it along. So the next part of this is all going to be about how you can kind of optimize your chances there. So um, I've kind of summarized it in three keys to the job search success. So first is define yourself clearly. Second is invest in some tech skills. And then the third is network, even if it feels bad, which I think is what Alex was talking about in that last session that I kind of, <laughs> that, I, that I jumped in on the last couple minutes of. Um, so first define yourself clearly. Um, you wanna craft a resume and a profile. I'm gonna just kind of talk through this a little bit, not super in depth. Um, Mostly what I want to say is the things to emphasize. So skills, you want to break these into parts, which is a really, uh, a really important piece of advice that I got early on. So break it into things like your technical skills, skills that you have in the kind of projects that you've done, and then maybe your language skills. Um, secondly, it's kind of counterintuitive because we're used to writing CVs where, you know, you really emphasize I worked with this person at this university and we did these projects. You really actually want to de-emphasize your education stuff. A lot of the resumes that I've seen, um, you know, they'll have like two lines where they got their BA, where they got their PhD, or where they got their MA, maybe three, two, two to three lines, and that's it. There's really no other information about that. Um, which which for someone coming from academia, you think, well, why wouldn't you want to know? Um, and then any supplemental skills or trainings or certificates, projects you've done, use the rest of that space that you might have put, you know, emphasizing the education portion, use that to highlight your skills. So research skills, project management, data collection, all of these things that we do as linguists um, that we might not think of as project management or data collection or things like that. Um, you want to you want to highlight those things, um, and then very quickly, I want to talk about tailing your resume to a job posting. So, um, in a lot of the resumes that I've looked at uh, in the past couple of years, there's a little profile blurb at the top. You know, it says something like where you graduated from, what 
what your expertise is in, what you're looking for. Um, this, this piece of advice does mean that you might need multiple copies of your resume. You, you have to tailor, tailor your resume for the job posting, for the recruiter who is looking at the language of the job posting and looking for, um, you know, for those skills that are in the, in the job posting. So I'm not gonna, you know, read through this again, you can look at this later, but just notice that like the language of this, and I pulled this from an actual job posting. Um, if the language of the job posting says that they are looking for people who know how to um, improve acoustic and, and phonology models, Maybe you, you put speech and acoustic patterns in your resume profile. You put things like experimental design, which can you know um, match up with things like train and build models. So you know, really looking at how, um, how the, the job has, has put together what they want in a candidate can really help you have the most success with getting to that recruiter, which means getting to the next level for interviews. Um, another thing you want to do is situate yourself as who you are. So um, I got a this this may not work for everyone, but I got a piece of advice recently that said, um, since a lot of our job, the job postings aren't looking for specifically a linguist, what you want to do is Position yourself as a researcher, as a data scientist, first and foremost, as something familiar, and then bring in those linguistic skills on top as something that sets you apart from other candidates in, in the job pool. So why are you the one to hire? Um, why, do you, why are you the one that should get this position? Um, I think thinking about it in this way, um, is easier for recruiters and easier for hiring managers because linguists aren't are kind of few and far between in a lot of in a lot of companies and so you know just just saying that you are this thing but you're also a linguist on top of it might make you stand out that much more um second key is invest in tech skills again i'm not going to go through these all um one by one because I think there are a couple of sessions on that but you know if you don't have some da basic data manipulation skills or know a little bit about speech and language processing or if you're interested do some coding courses or boot camps there's some good free ones out there too um, definitely invest in in things like that um, and then also kind of as a corollary know that the skills that you do have already are transferable and know how you can frame it. Um, I'm gonna again skip through this a little bit quickly because I wanna I want to make sure that there's room for questions. But um, the third key is this network, even if it feels bad. So I again won't go in too much detail because I know Alex has covered a lot of this, but um, again, if you get this slideshow, um, these are links to two LinkedIn profiles. I've gotten the okay from them. They're okay to be used, so you can go there, you can look at them. Um, some of the things to really note about their profiles are the level of description that they provide in their previous jobs. Um, they also provide things like their licenses and their certifications. So, you know, they took they took little UX courses and they put that in there. They took project management courses and they put the certificate that you get in there. Um, and hiring man managers and team members that you're going to be working with, they're probably going to look you up on LinkedIn and they're going to see these things and they're going to say, oh, okay, this person is serious. They've done these, these courses. They have these skills. They've been endorsed for these particular things. Um, and then again, reach out to those contacts, those friends, acquaintances, friends of friends, um, and ask them, do the informational interview I guess I heard the very end of that, that might be a US specific thing, but it sounds like, you know, from my experience looking for jobs in the US, everybody that I've reached out to has been totally willing to do, you know, 20 minute, uh, well, in-person chat or over Zoom, 
uh, no big deal. And really the worst case scenario um, is that they don't respond and there's really not much to lose. Um, most people are really happy to help actually. Um, so, all oh, right, and the best case, they can hand your resume right to a recruiter, which is really the best case scenario. Um, cool, so I am over time. Thank you so much, and uh, we can do we can do questions now. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I was keeping track of some questions I wanted to highlight for you, please. Cool. And, and as we go through, also, you can feel free to raise your hand non-verbally raise your digital hand and we'll, we'll call on you. You can also just unmute. So one question was about timeline because mm -hmm. timeline in the industries that support these kinds of positions is very different from academia, which is very different from federal job hiring. So what's the timeline? If you graduate, for example, in summer 2022, what would be mm -hmm. a good time to start submitting applications? That's a really good question. Unfortunately, it kind of depends on the company, um, but I would say probably three to four months before you want to have the position, start applying for the position. Of course, you know, you're probably not gonna get, you're probably not gonna hear back from everybody that you apply to. Um, and some people are faster than others. So a couple of just anecdotal um, uh, experiences. So contractors tend to get back to you much quicker. They tend to have a higher immediate need. So getting a contract position is um, probably the quickest way to get into um, this. Um, there's kind of some there's some debate as to whether getting a contracting position will then be able to launch you into a full-time position if that's what you're looking for, um, but we'll put that aside. Um, for Amazon, they're actually really quick. So when I interviewed for Amazon, um, I submitted my resume at the end of November. I got a call back in December and then um, interviewed the first week of January and started the second week of February. So that was really um, a little un like all things told between when I applied and when I got the job was just a little bit under three months um, and then started a little bit later than that. I have also heard of people at Google where their job process has gone on for six, seven months because they, they kind of hire for the role and if there's no role filled, but you have, um, you've gotten the role, then you can kind of just be in this limbo phase until that role opens up again. So, sorry, go ahead, Alex. No, thank you, Kelsey. I, I just wanna, thanks for talking about, you know, the, the variation in timeline. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanna differentiate is sort of your active job search time and everything that precedes that. And really what you wanna be doing starting now is investing time in building out your network, which is what is gonna pay off later when you are in the active phase of applying for your jobs because exactly what networking does and what informational interviewing does, that is your research project. And that will help you hone the areas, the sectors, and the types of jobs that may be a good fit for you. So what you wanna avoid doing is end of fall semester, beginning of spring semester before you graduate, you wanna avoid suddenly starting then and like, now what am I gonna do? <laughs> What's a good fit for me? Right. Invest time now during this month. This is what we're here for in building out your network and learning about different positions, learning about different levels of positions, day-to-day -day life, that's what's gonna pay off label, pay off later when you search for announcements. You'll have that knowledge in the back of your brain about what organizations you wanna target, what sectors of right fit, who can look over your resume for you. Mm -hmm. And so, so you're in the right place to start now looking for those jobs. And I know there's a hand up, but we had one, one 
question further back that was uh, duplicated about what tech skills should we learn and where should we start? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I think that that really depends on what kind of job you're looking for. So if you're looking for a position that is in the natural language understanding, natural language processing um, you know, realm, a really good place to start is actually Jurafsky and Martin's um, speech and language processing book. It gives a really great overview, um, you know, written by a linguist. So, you know, in language that we understand um, of just what goes into uh, building a, a voice assistant, basically building speech processing models, building language processing models. Um, from there, then they do have some um, some some exercises and like assignments that you can assign yourself. And from there, you can kind of see like, oh, you know, are my Python skills good enough that I can just manipulate the things that are here um, for my own needs? Or do I need to do a little bit more um, focused study on, you know, how to how to manipulate things in Python? Um, a really good thing is just like knowing your way around the command line. If that's a if that's, you know, in your um, in your vision for the kind of job that you want uh, in the future. Um, and then just, yeah, basic familiarity with, I mean, even with like Excel data analysis. So, you know, can you can you look at um, a bunch of numbers and make sure that whether things are statistically significant? Can you look at, um, Well, sorry, I had another train of thought at the same time. <laughs> One thing that people are really interested in right now is um, inter annotator agreement. So there's a lot of um, annotation that goes on and from different annotators. And so how can you be sure that we're getting good data from these annotators that you might have from that you might know or that you might just have gotten through Mechanical Turk. Um, so those kind of things are, are good just as jumping off points. I do also have um, a couple of slides at the end of the presentation in an appendix with some links to other, other things as well. You know what, Kelsey, when you just raised this term that's new to me of inter-annotator agreement, and that mm -hmm. being position and the type of work, this is an area which I think would relate to people who study applied linguist linguistics and who focus on inter-rater reliability. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Transferable skill, and that's an example of language you would want to adopt. You would want to look for that, and you would want to adopt it in your own materials. Don't necessarily talk about yourself as having experience in inter-rater reliability. Talk instead about inter annotate. Talk about make that draw that connection for that. Yeah. Is exactly. What I want to yeah. Say. And yeah. um, I'll see if you don't mind. There's a question getting a lot of traction in the chat. What about if a job says they require five experience, five years of experience in the field, but you meet all other requirements? I just saw this for a language engineer job at Amazon. How much do they care about work experience if you have a strong linguistic background? Like PhD? You should just apply anyway. <laughs> That's my, that is my advice. Just apply anyway. A lot of these companies they say that they want five years of experience, but a lot of, in a lot of cases, you know, Alexa has only been around since 2014. So you will, you'd have to have been, you know, working on Alexa since 2016 to have five years of experience um, in that position. So, you know, those are pretty flexible usually. And also, you know, you have, if you're in a, a MA program, a PhD program, count those years as experience. Those are years of linguistic experience. Um, you are a linguistic professional, so count those years. There's one thing I wanna address. So Christina in the chat asks, was there really only one interview for Amazon? No, there, were, um, there was one phone interview um, and then there was a whole day of five interviews um, that was in person. So it was it was pretty rigorous, but the the turnaround time for Amazon scheduling those interviews was pretty pretty small. 
And maybe, yes, you're back. Thank you, Wei Oh, hi. Um, thank you for all this um, presentation. It's super informative and very useful. I'm wondering about switches between jobs. Like if you get a contractor job and then you want to switch to something better, but then you are afraid of offending people at your original position. Like how do you deal with that? And um, when do you let people know that you're going to be sweet, um, do the switching? That's a good question. So I think specifically between contractor positions and full-time positions, I think people are really understanding, especially in my experience, because they know that you're, you're a contractor, this is a limited time that you're gonna be spending. They have to know that you're going to be looking for other opportunities while you're doing that. Um, and so when I transitioned from being a contractor to being um, a full-time employee, you know, I think it was the standard I think I gave maybe two weeks notice, but then ended up, there was a project that I, I was kind of passionate about and really wanted to see to the end. So I ended up, you know, going for three weeks. Um, but that was, that was really, um, it was not as hard as you would have thought it would, have, it would be. Um, then switching between uh, full-time roles, you know, in my experience, it was a bit difficult. Um, you know, of course, the position that you're at doesn't want to see you go. But I mean, it, it really is dependent on on what you see for yourself as something that's going to be what you want. And when I was at Amazon, I realized, you know, this is not really the position that I want. Um, it's not the thing that is working for me right now. And, you know, when I had that conversation with my manager, um, at that time, you know, he was he was sad to see me go. He wanted to try to get me to stay, but ultimately, you know, realized that it was the best decision for me. And I still do have have good relationships with all the people that I've worked with at Amazon. So it's not, you know, you don't want to burn the bridge, obviously, but I think people are really understanding about that. Thanks for the question. I see uh, Charlotte, I think you have your hand raised. Hello, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was very interesting to see the overview of different jobs. Um, so I wanted to ask a question that was asked in the chat by way, I think, and I don't think the question has been addressed, but if it has, I'm sorry. Um, it was the question of citizenship. We started a, a Slack channel um, to have international people talk among each other to talk about visa processes. And so mm -hmm. I think a lot of us would like to know what um, are there constraints in terms of citizenship and work permits in tech? Um, if it's like, if you're like, I'm a student, I'm on a student visa right now and mm -hmm. I can get an OPT visa after that. But then if I want to continue, I would have to have like an HB1 or something like that. Right. And so if you know anything about the recruitment of people who are not citizens, thank you. Sure, no, I think that, that uh, that's a really great point to bring up. And I think that at least from coworkers that I've had, it's not an easy process, but if, the, if you are the correct, if you're the right fit for the position and they're the person that you, they want, those employers are going to do whatever they can in their power to help you out with that. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that visa and immigration services are going to be, that's not going to be any easier than it is, you know, but the company, at least if they're hiring you, they have your back on that. Um, and I do know a couple of people who transitioned off of an OPT visa onto an HB1. Um, there were, you know, there were a couple of hiccups. It was pretty stressful for her uh, for a couple of weeks, but it did work and she's still employed and it's totally fine. Um, I know, I don't know the specifics, but I could ask my coworker who had a bit of a difficulty. So he started at one position and wanted to move to another job, but there were some restrictions on his visa that made it so that he really couldn't move to another job easily. Um, I will get that information and I can maybe send it to either Alex or Emily and 
and hopefully we'll have some info on that for you. And if I could follow up really quickly, we, we do have someone coming to office hours who will address this very thing, an international person who will talk about the challenges of being an international person searching for jobs within the US and securing them. And we'll also address working abroad as well. So I'm going to search, <clears throat> put their name in the chat. For now, I want to thank our presenter, Kelsey Krause. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It was, it was great to talk to you all. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, you know, add me on LinkedIn, uh, find me wherever, send me an email. I'm, I'm super willing to, you know, to talk to people to help, help more linguists get into tech.